Hi, welcome to this session, and we talk about Longhorn. So my name is Shen Yang. I'm engineering director for from SUSE, and I'm the or original author of Longhorn. And uh, as you know, Rancher, as the also the original company behind Longhorn, has bought into the SUSE three two three years ago. So I hope at least some of you here know what Longhorn is. But just to recap. Longhorn is a way to give you persistent storage support for any Kubernetes clusters. And you can easily install it. It's easy to use, easy to maintain. And it's open source, has no string attached. And uh, you can find out more details at longhorn.io. And there are a few things when we design Longhorn we take to our Hard as the design principles. And obviously, when you design a new storage product from ground up, there have to be some focus and some compromise to be made. And the long term focus on three things reliability, usability, and maintainability. So, in the reliability side, long term is essentially backing by the block devices created by the long term storage layer and is crash consistent. We have also building a multiple layers of protection against the data loss. So in Longhorn itself, within the cluster, you have the in-cluster snapshot mechanism, which able to like periodically snapshot your volumes whenever you need it. And you have also an out-of-cluster backup mechanism built in, and with no third-party like software required to enable you to backup your data to outside the cluster, like S3 or NFS endpoint, in case like you have the whole cluster went down and you cannot find any copy of things, like your data center in the worst case went up in fires, you still have a copy of your data somewhere else to keep you safe. And more than that, in fact, Longhorn itself has been built to be very resilient. And if you have the scenario, you have the whole cluster went down with, like, say, your control plane, Kubernetes, everything is down. As long as you still have the hard drive, the home can recover your full data from that without, like, really have to go. You don't need to go through very complicated recovery step. It's very simple. So those kind of protection we add in based on our ex experience on the previous other products. That is the one focus. That's the biggest focus for the Longhorn. And the second focus for the Longhorn, as in fact for old products and pro projects from the Rancher Labs, is the usability. So from day one, Longhorn is designed to be simple to use, simple to deploy. You can deploy Longhorn in one-click installation. You can do the Helm chart install. You can do the like YAM apply. And obviously, if you are using Rancher, you can also install it from the Rancher catalog. But any of these ways all works, and by default, Longhorn can detect whatever is the available space in your disk and able to utilize like immediately after deploying it. And you definitely have a lot of options to customize later, but we are really proud of this, like a lot of effort we went into the automatic detect the environment and deploy the best options for you. And also, we have provided the UI out of box and this, in fact, UI has been our way to operate a lot of long-home functionalities, like snapshot, backup, node scheduling, and many advanced functionality has been exposed both from the UI and API. So those makes long-home stands out to easy to like really adapt in a complicated Kubernetes world. And the last thing Longhorn like really want to achieve is the maintainability. And Longhorn itself, as you can see later. It's in fact very easy to understand, and also because it's easy to understand. So when something wrong happens, it's also easy for the DevOps to understand like why it's happening and what is happening, and then easy to recover even in the worst case scenario. And the Longhorn from like very early days, maybe five years ago, already start uh, to support upgrade with interrupting the workload. So you are you have a peace of mind to do your upgrade whenever you have a little bit of downtime, like like downtime in the sense of like say you have don't have like much other work to do. It doesn't require the workload downtime, right? So in fact, we can see from our 
um, public telemetry data say most of the Donghua user, in fact, is on the latest release. That's all thanks to our non-interruptive upgrade process. All right, so what's the latest one? The latest Longhorn feature release, 1.5, has been released a few months back. And it's an enterprise-grade distributed storage software for Kubernetes. We went from distributed block storage software to distributed storage software. It's a subtle differentiator there, because now Longhorn currently support rerunning money support um, storage as well. And in the future, I'm going to talk about and demo that very soon, we're going to support object storage uh, using S3 API as well. So you can one click to install it on, on any Kubernetes clusters, no matter it's running on bare metal, it's running on the VM, it's running on the cloud, it all works as long as it's Kubernetes. And it supports x86-64 and ARM64. In fact, it's another thing. Like we have been adding and contributed, frankly, by the community user to add the support and IBM mainframe. Yep. So on the volume side, and the key functionality, we have the feature parity for the most like enterprise um, software on the, in the market: stream provisioning, snapshot with schedule, expansion, clone, and to end encryption, which is critical for lots of customers and cross-AZ, cross availability cross zone scheduling. This is mostly for the cloud providers like AWS. And when they have the EKS um, control plane across AZ had the hash HA, but their EBS volume is always attached to a single availability zone, which can result in like your workload down when your like AZ is down. And the long run help you to solve that problem as well. So in the later release, we have add bit route and detection and the trim, which is going to help tremendously with your storage space management. And uh, rewrite many support, it's now also GA, and the data locality to ensure that your replica can co-locate it with your where the data is to pro provide you the best performance and availability. On the disaster recovery side, Longhorn was building with the backup and restore feature from day one. And that is the incremental backup and incremental restore when needed. That's give you the best efficiency uh, for your and the safety for your data outside the cluster. And we have also supported the cross cluster disaster recovery volume with defined RPO and RTO. And this is to enable users to able to have like a main cluster and then the backup cluster and constantly shipping the replica data from the main cluster to the backup cluster in asynchronized way. And whenever, so you have the case, if you have main cluster goes down, you can easily like spin up the backup cluster within a couple of minutes uh, without waiting for the old data to be restored from your backup store. So on the operational side, we provide intuitive UI out of the box and the line mark grade without interruption the workload. And we have added the Prometheus support recently and the storage tag for you to customize how you want uh, your storage to be scheduled. And you can have like your volume, one volume created all on the NVMe disk. Another volume say you want for just cold storage, you can add mix into um, the spinning disk on the other one. So on the Kubernetes support, Longhorn is in fact built on top of Kubernetes and Kubernetes is all we do. Right, so obviously we support all the, uh, the, in, uh, the protocol there, the CSI interface, container storage interface, and the extension to the CSI like Snapshotter, and in fact clone and uh, extension is also there. We have also added automatic recovery for the Kubernetes managed workload. Um, that is in fact the one thing like a long-term building on top of Kubernetes to using the feature to complement the Kubernetes. Um, as you might know, sometimes when you have the stateful workload uh, running on different nodes, and if you, that node went down, you mostly will expecting the node, like the pod running on that, and the volume get reallocated to another one, but that is not, unfortunately, the default Kubernetes behavior. There's a reason behind it, um, uh, but many customers found it's very annoying, and the long run, in fact, I have uh, enhanced itself to help the user to get the recovery better, right? So for the 1.5, we have a huge milestone feature, which even though it's in the pre-release, is the 
the long-haul engine V2 based on the new technology called SBDK, and I'm going to talk about a little bit more on this later. All right, so as I mentioned, long-haul is very simple, and if you haven't seen this, and I can quickly go through it, and everybody will understand how it works. You have two nodes, both have a disk and a CPU and a RAM, and this is obviously forming a Kubernetes cluster, and you have one part requesting a volume, and in this case, long form, we are going to create two replicas, which pointing on the, on, residing on the two different nodes using two different disks, and create one engine to connect into those two replicas, and providing the block device into uh, the pod to serve for the volume. This is essentially just a simple read one um, architecture there, and the Longhorn can have like from one replica to 10 replicas, which is arbitrarily limited we put in there. We don't know anyone is doing that, um, but uh, that is like how flexible it is. And also, you can see if you have like second part on the volume, and you can create the same set of replica and engine, and the same set of replica and engine for the new set of volume as well. So there are two advantages to this design is first, you can see from the data pass, which is the, the lines shows up and arrows there. Um, those volume, even though they reside in the same system, the data pass is not in the wind. And that means like even you have like one replica down, you can at most affect like one volume. And obviously, if you have an other replica still, wo still working, there's no interruption. And if you have, even you have like one engine down, it at worst case, just one wouldn't get affected. All the other volumes on the system will not going to be like um, get involved anyway. Another thing you can see that is on the engine side, we always co-located the engine with the where the workload part is. So in a case like when the node went down, which is the most common case the storage world need to deal with, and obviously, the engine will be down, but that is because the part, the workload itself, will be down as well. So in that case, Kubernetes will going to relocate the part, and the engine will follow it to point it to the available replicas later. Um, but the thing is, like traditionally, those engine the pro uh, replicas processes need to be scheduled in a way which is like kind of complicated. But now, with Kubernetes help, and those components can be easily scheduled and orchestrated by Kubernetes, which give you us a way to like really doing this microservice-based like storage engine here. I can go to a little bit of details on how engine works. And now you can see you have three nodes and uh, uh, the black uh, and the different kind of disk there. The black one is like the data disk, and the gray one you think is like root disk. So. You have a still have the pod went down and the replica created and that is created with what we call the instance manager, which is aggregation of the process on the node, and the create engine and the two set, the second set, and the third set. That's all good. But what if you have one node went down, the node one is down, right? So node one is down and the pod B and the C create still on the node two. We are not going to get impacted because their engine will automatically cut the communication from the uh, replicas from the first um, node. And the part, uh, the part A, we are going to get relocated by the Kubernetes with the volume, which is going to promote Longhorn to create another engine on the node 3, even like node 3 has no local uh, disk and local storage. And the engine from the node 3, we are going to find out, OK, who is the remaining replicas? of this uh, part, like for this volume. So I'm going to connect to it, and everything restored. So that is how the failover um, in the Longhorn happens on the uh, block level. And that takes like a milliseconds for the engine to switch over uh, to cut out the replicas. And it takes uh, like a couple of seconds, a couple of minutes for the Kubernetes to, to decide to relocate the part. That's entirely decide like how Kubernetes want to do that. All right. so. A little bit on the community side, we have, in fact, um, counting on 99,900 plus worldwide live node right now. And I hope, like, by the time I'm giving this talk, it's going to reach like 100,000. But I think we are, like, this morning I checked, it's, it's like 100 nodes shy. 
And we still maintain a very high growth rate at 50% plus. And you can find those adoption metrics available at metrics.longhong.io. And uh, you can see from the, um, the picture there, we have quite a run um, from like, uh, I think it's 2019 to now. Yeah, so we have more than 3,000 users in the Slack channel and 5,000 plus stars from GitHub. And really, the most interesting I want to talk about is the upcoming Longhorn 1.6 release. So as I mentioned before, we are working on the SPDK engine and uh, called the Longhorn Engine V2, and that is based on SPDK and the NVMe over fabric technology. And uh, SPDK is a storage performance development kit developed by the Intel originally for its Octon hard drive. And this is very high performance using pooling instead of interrupt to get the maximum I.O. possible. And by like basically rewritten the Longhorn engine based on SPDK, we have achieved the near native performance for the V2 engine. And for the 1.6 release, which is due to which is due um, January next year, we are going to have a core feature functionality priority like a snapshot backup, and those um, features will be available. We are also introducing the object storage volume, which is provide you a S3 endpoint to use it within the Longhorn directly. You can find out more roadmap information at GitHub uh, Longhorn VK roadmap. And let's talk about like how it's different from the Longhorn Engine V1 versus V2. So in Engine V1, you will have this stack at uh, the, the workload level, and you have application. I hope it's like big enough for everybody to see. Um, application going to read or write the file system, which is in turn going to talk with the iSCSI block device created by the Longhorn. And iSCSI, that's initiator talking to the Longhorn TGT, which is the um, user space iSCSI framework we use to expose the block device. And that TGTD is in turn talk to the Longhorn engine using uh, some customized API and the protocol and uh, use and also through the Unix domain socket. And that means like obviously engine is going to be on the same node as the workload. And the engine in turn uses customized protocol over TCP to talk with the replica on a different node, which replica in turn to access the sparse file on the file system. And that's the file system in the end, of course, going to access the block device. So if you have multiple replicas and that is uh, like you just do it for um, the multiple times for the replica. So that is how engine looks, V1 looks like. On the engine V2, which is based on SPDK, we have dramatically shortened the data pass. Obviously, application, they want to rewrite the file system, nothing you can change there. But instead of using iSCSI, we're using MMV over fabric protocol to expose the block device. It's still going to be on the same node, but we are using SPDK, which is also a user space target to providing the block device. And we have rewritten the Longhorn engine to be embedded inside SBDK. That is written in C. So we has greatly, like we already reduced and just eliminated communication between the previous TGTD and the Longhorn engine. And now they just like an inter, like internal process communication. And by that, we have achieved a zero copy from SBDK um, received a package down, uh, to uh, the Longhorn engine spread out like uh, talking to the replicas. And the Longhorn TGTD, like Longhorn engine is going to talk to the Longhorn SBDK target on the other node using MVMV over TCP protocol as well. And that is also embedded already uh, the Longhorn replica logic in there. And that is also being rewritten. So the Longhorn replica now is going to access the raw block device instead of the file system. So one level less, one layer less to reduce the overhead. So if you have like multiple replicas, like the replica side of our character remain the same. But there's one even more interesting question. What if you have those distributed like database, they only want like one replica, but still want the best performance and the ability to maintain your uh, snapshot and backup mechanism? That's when you want this. Longhorn NGV2 also have a dramatic improvement 
for the local replica mode, which you have like one replica collocated with your workload. In this case, the workload, like the application, right into a file system, which in turn go to the NVMe um, over fabric back block device, that's all same, but the SPDK target part has already shortcut everything in it. So the longhorn engine inside can talk to a longhorn replica inside like directly, which talk to the local Roblox device directly. So that has dramatically shortened the data path, and we have achieved the zero copy from the point of the package in, into the SBDK target to getting to read or write the data on the disk. So by this way, you have achieved a near performance, a near native performance, and we still maintain the same feature for the volume, like snapshot, backup, expansion, everything available to the normal volume will be available to this local replica mode. And this is best suited for distributed state for workload, which means that they don't require high availability from the long form. They are going to maintain themselves, they're doing the shedding themselves, and but they want to still have you still want to have like consistent way to maintain uh, your old workload, like distributed or non-distributed. So the distributed database or data store will be very suited for this use case. So what's the performance we see? And IO ops, you can see the blue one, bar, blue bar there is the native performance, and the red bar there is the performance for uh, v, V2 engine, and the yellow bar there is performance for the V1 engine. So you can see that for the read and the write, and both um, the local replica mode and the replica, like three replica mode for the V2 engine has been dramatically improved over the V1. Uh, the V1 engine data, and in fact, we are also continuously improving that and make sure that there's definitely going to be more can be get down there. And we have also on the, um, you can see that the neo-native neo performance, not only for um, the single replica, is if you are using like looking at the read data, that's also there. So on the throughput side, because on the long run, we are reading from um, multiple replicas when you do the read, and that means like we can aggregate the throughput from multiple nodes at the same time. That means like you can see from the sequential read and the random read, uh, the engine v2 data has been like a tripled value what is coming, like what is available from the local disk. So now is the really the most important thing is latency is the king. Latency is the king for the storage. So on the long-form engine V2, we have achieved the single node latency overhead in less than 30 microseconds for the local volumes. Obviously, if you're going to the network, it's going to be slightly higher, but it's still a vast improvement to the VY engine, and in fact, maybe the fastest out there in the market as well. All right, so that's all for the V2 engine. Another thing I want to talk about for the one dot. Uh, sixth release is object storage volume, and we are providing S3 endpoint out of box because our customer really want a unified storage solution rather have the different things piecing together to give their, um, to, to provide the S3 endpoint object storage support. So starting with 1.6, we are utilizing the, the project called S3 Gateway within SUSE. Venture and which is based on the Rados Gateway from Ceph to implement this object storage volume. And one seek we are going to declare this feature as experimental, and we have uh, already implemented get, put, delete, multipart upload, um, object store like object versioning, locking, and that those features will be available, and there are more features will be coming. So for the object storage volume, it looks like this. You will have, like we are working with the Ceph upstream to have the Rados gateway adapt to this approach. And the Rados gateway is, in fact, very mature, has a long-standing um, provider for the object store. And the S3 API layer is being, like, I already know that it's going to be hard to maintain that layer. So that is, in fact, we're taking that from the upstream Rados gateway to ensure the best quality for that. And Rados gateway, they have, um, um, abstraction layer called the zipper driver abstraction layer. And uh, after that, it's going to be more of the self-specific. Uh, specific. 
And we have uh, replaced that with S3 Gateway file-based driver backend to put that on top of the Longhorn Block device. And the Longhorn Block volume, and in turn, like um, in this case, providing the whole package to the end user as the Longhorn object storage volume. And you are going to have the S3 client con connecting to, uh, you can create uh, connected to how many like object storage volume like you want. And you can create more than one. And this, in the end, this is the backing by the Longhorn block device, block volumes. So, OK, so um, due to time limit, I'm going to do a very short demo. And give me a second to switch. And I really hope this works. All right, so what I'm going to demo here is the new object storage volume feature. And this is the Rancher, as you might be familiar with. And this is the, a simple demo cluster we created. And if you go to the Longhorn tab here, you will see the general overview for the Longhorn volume. And you keep know there's three nodes here. And there's a couple of volume here that's all no new, uh, not news. But there's a new tab called object storage. So this is how you're going to create an object storage volume. And if you want to do it, create object store and put the name, size, access key, secret key in there. And there's a few options on the endpoint. Uh, data placement, this is essentially how the exactly same as the long home volume. Itself, you can even specify what engine you want. And once you create it, for example, I have two here, I'm going to uh, you can, in fact, explore what is inside that um, object store endpoint. So administrator is going to give you to jump into the main AI and put your ACL access key secret key there. You can see that we have total one bucket. This bucket called bucket one. And I, don't, I didn't put anything in there, but now we can. So what I'm going to do now is switch back to the rancher. And I have a pod running here. And this pod is talking, um, it's S3 command, which I think most people may be familiar with. And I can execute into this pod. I hope this is big enough. Yes. So this is directly communicating to the object storage I created before. And if we want to take a look at how it looks like, you can see that, well, obviously, there's access key, secret key, which is highlight. Like, well, I'm not going to highlight that. But this is the endpoint. So test object store, which is the object store name, dot longhorn system, service cluster local. This is addressing using the internal Kubernetes DNS. And there is the one settings you might need to pay a little bit more attention is to yeah, so how the bucket format is and put it something like this there. And encryption no, PGT, PGT no, and this is HTTP. We are going to uh, add guideline to how to do HTTPS later and no proxy and credential yes. Okay, so they have successfully verified it's connected. And I'm going to not need to save this setting because this setting is good enough. Like, is that big enough? Okay, I'm going to do a little bit. Over the board here. All right. So now, if I go to ls3 command list, and I can see the bucket one there, and obviously I can do. It's nothing in there. Yeah. So now I'm going to get something in there. Okay. So. Uh, this is another project harvest, uh, like uh, uh, the rancher is working on. This is open source hyperconverged infrastructure. I'm just going to grab some fire here. And obviously, Harvester is also based on Longhorn for the storage layer. But uh, let me just grab a file, which is big enough to make a dent. OK, so we have complete, like downloaded this file. Now next, I'm going to upload it. OK, so it's down. Like, let me see if they're really, it's really there. All right, it's really there. So how can we know that it's right? So let me just, all 
rename the current source file, and I'm going to download it. Okay, it's there. So let me try to run Shazam. Uh, run command. Yeah, they're identical. So we have successfully uploaded and download using very common S3 command. And once it's there, you can also see that from the bucket, which is now oversizing. Just refresh it. You can see the file is there, and there are a few details you can see on the UI as well. And you can do see more things about that from the UI as well. OK, so that's my quick demo. I'm going to switch back. OK, so that concludes my presentation, the demo. Any questions? Yeah, the 1.6 one six will be available at January 2024. That is current our timeline. Yeah. So if you are asking about when will the Longhu Engine V2 will be GA quality, that is likely going to be the later next year and maybe slip into the year afterwards because like, yeah, we have rewritten the whole engine using C and yeah, so it's having like it's going to take some time for us to stabilize it. All right. OK, so we have a long home booth on the, the, the project part of the uh, show and showroom. And if you have any other questions, feel free to find me there. I will be there until the show closed. All right. Thanks, everyone.